Hi, this is Marcus Fares, founder and editor-in-chief of Dezine, broadcasting live from the Dezine studio in London. Today, I'm hosting a very special conversation with filmmaker Gary Hustwit, who is chairing the Dezine Awards media categories this year, and environmental design writer Katie Tregedon, who heads up the new sustainability categories. We're going to be discussing the fast-changing worlds of media and sustainability. So first of all, hi there, Gary. Hi, Marcus. How are you? How are you? It's a I'm year good. since we spoke. How's, how's your year been? <laughs> a year has gone by already. I, it's, I didn't notice. Just <laughs> flown by. Just briefly tell us who you are for anyone who doesn't know and also where you're speaking from. Uh, I'm uh, in uh, Brooklyn right now. Uh, I'm a uh, filmmaker and uh, photographer and do other random media projects. And, and I, I, I will speak more about that in my lovely zoom presentation that i'll be doing shortly <laughs> great and hi katie hi marcus so tell us a little bit about yourself where are you and what do you do i am in deepest darkest cornwall in the far southwest of the uk um and i am as you said a craft and sustainability writer author journalist podcaster and keynote speaker Brilliant. So welcome to both of you. And I'm just going to give a very short presentation now to explain why you're on board with Dezine Awards. So Dezine Awards is in its fourth year now. The 2021 cycle started at the start of this year. Uh, and for the first time, we've introduced um, some media categories. Uh, there are five categories which will award the best architecture photograph, best architectural video, the best visualization, and the best website by a creative studio and also the best website by uh, a brand. And chairing those new categories are Gary Hustwit, who we'll be speaking to in a sec. And then also, we've always had a sustainable architecture category at Design Awards, but this year we've bundled, we've created two additional categories and bundled them all together uh, as our the sustainability categories. And they will be looking for the best sustainable building, uh, interior, and design. And chairing that jury is Katie. So that's the background to the new categories that we've launched this year. And this was an opportunity for us to get to know our head judges and for also for them to get to know each other a little bit. And also lead into a, a broader discussion about... I mean, it's been an incredible year for explosion of the media, particularly digital media. People have been at home, people have been streaming, people have been watching Netflix, people have been getting excited about new developments like NFTs and VR and all those kind of things. And then at the same time, there's been an explosion of interest in sustainability in all its various forms. Um, and I'm sure we'll get on to the tension between those two different phenomena, the, the media in particular, it's a massive drain on resource, particularly power resources. But to start off with Gary, let's go back to you. You're going to give us a little presentation about you and your work. Yeah, sure. Let me uh, a little share a screen here. And I will do that. So um, yeah, so I've been um, making films now, uh, mostly about design for um, gosh, 16 years, but uh, I never really had any desire to be a filmmaker or to make media. Um, it was just in 2005, I really wanted to watch a documentary about fonts and there was nothing out there. I mean, nothing, there were no documentaries about graphic design or, or, or even design like feature length um, films. So um, I decided to just pick up a camera and uh, I made Helvetica. Um, this, this is me uh, standing in front of the uh, birthplace of, of Helvetica back in 2005 in uh, Switzerland. And as you see, I'm looking very excited about, uh, about <laughs> making a film about fonts. Um, but uh, people seem to like that uh, film and I uh, went on to make uh, other films about design, things that I was interested in, um, that there weren't really films about, um, industrial design, um, urban design, uh, design of the office. Um, most recently I made a film about designer Dieter Rams. Um, and in addition to uh, these movies that I directed, I've also produced another eight or nine um, feature films uh, some design related, some music related and art related. Um, the uh, 
kind of film has been a way for me to kind of explore things that I'm interested in and things that I want to learn more about. Um, I was part of a, uh, a virtual reality studio called Scenic, uh, which we produced about um, about 20 different VR experiences, everything from uh, a piece uh, here with Sam Green about um, Buckminster Fuller's uh, domes to um, uh, putting viewers inside a, a youth prison. Um, I've also gotten more into still photography over the years. At first kind of started out as a way for me to document um, the films I was making, uh, like the portrait of Dieter Rams here, or just kind of behind the scenes moments. Uh, but then this, for me, started to being um, more of a, um, a creative medium. And I uh, got involved in a documentary photography project called The Olympic City. Um, and since 2008, uh, another photographer, John Pack, and I have been traveling to former Olympic host cities and documenting uh, what remains. We've been to um, 20 cities uh, uh, so far and have published a few different book projects and exhibitions about it. Um, so it's for me, it's just another kind of extension of, um, of uh, visual storytelling. Sometimes a, a, uh, um, a subject might be a feature length film, sometimes it might be a short, it might be a photo project. I'm just kind of using all those things uh, to kind of, um, you know, look at that things I'm interested in. So um, most recently I did a, a short um, film um, uh, called uh, The Map, which is about the digital redesign of the New York City subway map by uh, Work & Co. Carrying on with my obsession with um, Massimo Vignelli and, the, uh, <laughs> and his uh, landmark 1972 map, which I've got another upcoming project that's loosely based upon that. I'm going to stop sharing now. I think I can stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, I, I can see you now. Yeah, it is great. Um, but uh, when I look today and see, uh, you know, design media, um, what I see is just, as you said, that there's an explosion of it. There's there's so much of it, um, and you know that combined with all the the media that we're seeing in our daily lives, everywhere else, all the photos and videos that that um, we're all generating, and I think that so everything looks great. Like in the design media I've seen, everything looks looks really good now. Everyone's got great cameras. Everyone's got nice drones. You know, everyone's got, you know, beautiful high speed slow motion photography, uh, you know, on our on our phones. Um, but it, it, for me, it's always about the, the ideas and about the, the concepts. And I'm not seeing a lot of uh, strong, you know, breakthrough conceptual work or as much as I'd, I'd like to see. And for me, that's that's always the most important thing. I'd rather see somebody doing something really original and maybe not quite executing it, but at least trying to kind of break the mold than a beautifully executed, very well done, but boring photograph or video or visualization. So for me, that's what I'm always, uh, always looking for. So just to check, are you saying that you're, there's a lack of breakthrough innovation in media itself or in, or in, or in design? Are you talking I about the in, media? I, I think in, I, I'm focusing on the media. I, yeah. I, and I just think again, in, in the ideas behind this, the, the media, there, there's great technical breakthroughs. I mean, especially with like all the 3D rendering programs. I mean, I have, I have zero experience, but I can get into Houdini and at least like produce some basic shapes and put textures on them and lighting effects and stuff. The tools are incredible. Um, but it, it still comes down to the to the ideas, um, and and I'm seeing a lot of beautifully executed work that looks really you know um, obviously the subject matter is 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 different from you know uh, um, from film to film or photo to photo, but I'm not seeing a lot of um, a point of view or also just a justification of why this piece of media even needs to exist. And that's something we can talk about with Katie because a lot, there's so much of this stuff being made and uploaded and viewed and stored in the cloud and downloaded. Um, you know, I, I question why a lot of it uh, even, even needs to be. Well, I, I'm, as I'm sure Katie will agree, um, why does it need to exist is a question that the design media has been asking about a lot of, a lot of design that happens for a, a very, very long time. Hopefully, when you're judging the Design Awards media categories, you will find some meaningful 
projects. Although I think, I suspect that most of the, the work that we'll be judging will be media that captures design in the real world. It's, it communicates something that, that exists. And that was going to be my first question for you, that um, in your design projects, you've been using media to document design that happens in the real world, like a font is a 2D thing, uh, Dieter Rams made 3D things. Have you ever thought to turn your lens on media itself and explore media as a design phenomenon? Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> next question. <laughs> I, you know, I, I, I'm interested in it definitely, um, but uh, I, I think I'm more interested in in in, in documenting design. Um, I mean, for me, it's what what I want to want to explore. Um, I'm not a media critic, uh, you know. I, I, I'm I'm I think I intuitively like know if I, I like something or or not, um, and uh, you know, it's not that's a very subjective um, you know way to judge things, but um, but. Uh, yeah, I'm just you know, it, it, these projects take a long time. I mean, that, and that's that's something that that uh you know I'm also not really seeing as much of like people spending two or three years on a on a project on a media project, um and really putting in the the effort and the rigor to try to you know, um not and, as opposed to just like getting stuff out quickly you know just just getting getting videos out and just um you know uh. So I, I'm interested in it. I'm interested in the, the media landscape and in, in looking at it. I'm not interested in spending years trying to make a documentary about about the media of around design. But I suppose thinking about the media traditionally, it is a it is a medium through which you look at other things. Like I, I'm a journalist, so my, I consider my job to be to synthesize what's going on in the world, process it, edit it. And, and push it back out. Um, I guess what you were referring to this kind of this vacuous media storm we're in it is media that's about media itself and therefore not really saying anything. Is that kind of what you you think is happening to some extent? Um, yeah, but uh, again, I, I think it's you know um, I just think a lot of it is just not really justified, um, and, and, and not just media about media, but it's media about anything now, you know. I mean, we're, we're in a, an era where, you know, you can't go outside without taking a photo or a quick video with friends or, you know, a Instagram story or a TikTok or something like, uh, you know, this is a much like a much bigger conversation about just kind of unplugging and <laughs> experiencing life. I mean, Katie was just saying before before we got on that, you know, the UK just got out of lockdown and she just wanted to go hang out with friends and did not even bring a, a, her phone and could you know just experience it. Um, and I and I feel like we've had so much digital interaction over the past year now, way more than we have uh, you know in previous years. Part of me just wants to like you know, get, get away from, from digital media um, and social media for a while. And I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm not alone in that, in that thought. So what's your opinion then on the, these kind of emerging platforms and technologies that kind of replace the real world in a way? I mean, from, from virtual reality, which allows people to meet through a screen instead of in real life. I mean, what we're doing now, Zoom does allow us the same thing. And then right up to the explosion of interest in things like um, uh, cyber cryptocurrencies and NFTs, where you're able to trade using virtual currencies to buy virtual things that don't exist in the real world. So it seems like on the one hand, people want to get back to seeing their friends and feeling the wind on their face. But on the other hand, there's this whole non-existent world being built around us. Yeah. I mean, I think the idea of like creating um, scarcity or um, value in a, in a digital um, file, I think is, is interesting. Um, I, I'm less interested in kind of like the speculative trading of, of files, um, which in the kind of current incarnation of, of what NFTs are, it's, you know, it, it's not really even about the art, it's about the transaction and it's about the, you know, um, you know, like like gamification of of buying of buying art or buying a you know digital collectible. So, uh, you know, I, I I think I'm interested to see where it where it's headed. At the same time, and this brings in the sustainability uh, again. 
you know, um, it does take a tremendous amount of resources to kind of mint one NFT in the current, um, you know, kind of a, a version of these technologies. So, um, you know, that that has to change uh, in order for this to be, um, you know, uh, I, I think a viable, um, you know, way to uh, to produce work and to sell work. I mean, as someone who, you know, like I produce digital media and, I, and I'm constantly thinking about, um, you know, that idea, like it's just a digital file, it can be traded a million times, but, you know, is there an original of, you know, Helvetica, like, like this one file that I'll say, okay, this is the one. Um, it's, it's an interesting uh, concept and it obviously has been kind of turning the art world, you know, on its, on its head. Um, just because, you know, art is this sort of first wave of kind of the, the, the very visible, um, you know, NFT uh, world. So, but we'll see this, I think, moving into, uh, you know, so many other facets of, uh, of our day-to-day -day digital life too. So I think it's interesting. And what would be your advice to a young architect or a young designer who's brilliant at architectural design, um, but maybe not so good at communicating that. What, what, how should people approach documenting their work? To you talked about the, you know the, the masses amounts of social media and and so on and so forth, but they are useful channels for people, aren't they, to get their stuff out there? How how can people do it well and avoid the the cliches and the pitfalls? Yeah, I mean, I've always tried to collaborate with people that are that are great at it. Um, which is, um, you know, I think, you know, one way to do it. I, I, I hear a lot of um, people who, you know, either are designers or architects or, or who want to be filmmakers or documentarians, but just kind of like really can't get over the initial um, kind of barrier to, to entry. But collaborating with others who are great uh, or, or who have the, the gear and, you know, know how to edit and, and um, you know, have some grasp of visual effects, I think is, is, is always a, a great way. And I don't know, it's like, um, don't watch a lot of other architecture and design video, <laughs> I think would be, would be my, my, um, <laughs> my uh, uh, advice. I think everything, it looks so much like everyone else with the drone shots and the slider, camera sliders and the, you know, uh, it's like you've got to take inspiration from other places and and not be so you know insular so i think um you know looking at looking at at, at art and and looking at a uh, great film um but but it is not in the design category and trying to kind of like adapt some um ideas from those things or um you know just just experimenting i think uh, and again, not not watching a lot of what's out there and just trying to copy that. I personally feel that with architecture in, in particular, that the kind of the, the idea of the architectural photograph, you know, with the corrected verticals um, and usually no people and a, and a moody sky usually taken between 5 and 6 p.m. is so embedded culturally in in the discipline that when they make movies, they just put loads of those together yeah. to maybe speed it up a bit. I, I mean, I'm, I'm hoping that, that we'll see more than just, you know, beautifully done uh, films about beautiful new buildings um, from, from big firms. I mean, I think it's just as valid to do a really beautiful short film about, uh, you know, a broken down, you know, shed somewhere, um, you know, as long as there's a, there's a point of view and there's, there's an artistry in, in how that's made and a story, you know, I, I'm just as, as uh, uh, engaged with that as I am with the, you know, latest massive architecture uh, uh, studio piece. So um, I, I'd love to see just a kind of a broadening of, of, of what, of what, uh, of what gets entered um, because I think it's all valid. And, and I think there's things to be learned from, you know, uh, 60s social housing project in terms of an architecture uh, uh, film, um, you know, as much as kind of the, the, the all the new work that's being promoted. I was involved in a crit of um, media students at SciArc a couple of months ago, and the work was amazing. Actually, it was the 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 way they approached the short films was the design itself. It wasn't about someone else's building or about someone else's design. 
but the whole production was the design. But also crucially, which is what a lot of architects and designers missed, there was a kind of narrative with characters, which is sort of mm. buildings are stages on which people live their lives, aren't they? And often the yeah. media approach misses out on that. Yeah, I mean, that, that, that's, I think that's a great way to approach an architecture film or a design film is make it a fiction, make it a fiction narrative film and just place it within the design. There was a student, I can't remember which school he was at, an architecture student a long time ago in the early days of Dazeen. And for his final project, he designed this building. But rather than just present pictures of the building, he kind of made a cartoon murder mystery, which was based in his building, which was so brilliant, so clever. That's great. That's great. Yeah. But also that, I mean, I, I think that architecture, the architecture world hasn't quite figured out how to use new media, but the design world is much better at it because um, for a long time now, design students are kind of media makers as well as designers. So they kind of, they think about the documentation of their work simultaneously with the, with the making of their work. Mm -hmm. And then the output often is media rather than a useful thing. The, the, the documentation of it or the presentation of it is the, is the output. Yeah. And, and, you know, and you see this with all this, you know, amazing um, 3D visualization work that's happening. Like, um, I know that you, I think you recently talked to Andres Reisinger um, in, in Barcelona, who's been doing some, you know, imaginary furniture and imaginary rooms and imaginary spaces. Well, you know, it, it's all, um, you know, it's all in innovation. Um, and, and, you know, the, the medium itself is, you know, um, you know, 3D animated video. Um, but uh, but it's 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 native to to the media um, this this design work so I think that's fascinating and and I think just you know design even you know any product tells a story and and I think that um, you know that's obviously like the you know what a, a good photograph or a good you know video or a good piece of animation is doing too and there are just so many ways to do it so uh, you know again I'm I'm excited to um, to see some great work as part of the uh, the awards. Let's hope so. I mean, it's a bit of an experiment launching these categories, but we'll see. We'll see what happens. Um, let's go over to you know, Katie. Katie, but what I should have said at the beginning of the talk is I'd like you to both ask each other some questions. So if you'd be thinking about that now, um, and then when Katie's finished, then I can sit back and watch you two interview each other. Katie, are you ready? Yes, I am. Let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Cool, okay. Um, so yeah, just a brief introduction. Hang on, it's not letting me advance the slides. Here we go. Just a brief introduction to me. I'm an author, journalist, podcaster, and keynote speaker. Um, and I'm really looking at circularity and where craft design and sustainability kind of overlap. I really believe in the power of storytelling. Um, and so I've got this little line that planet Earth needs better stories. And that's very much what I'm trying to do is tell the stories that will help to bring about change. Uh, my most recent book is called Wasted When Trash Becomes Treasure. Um, and it profiles 30 designer makers who are using waste as a raw material. So looking across domestic waste, industrial waste, food, fashion and plastic. And there's kind of a bunch of in-depth essays from me in there, which are sort of talking about the, the context and the, and the systems and where this waste is coming from and why it's problematic. And then for each of those categories, I profile six designers who are using that waste as a resource um, and therefore helping to, to move towards the solution. And interestingly, not all of them are solutions in their own right. So there's a project in there called the Sea Chair by Swine Studio, which um, was only ever made on a tiny, tiny volume, but as important as the object was the film they made to go with it. So to what some of what you were just saying, Gary and Marcus, there's, there's very much this space where the film that comes out of the product design making process is as important as the object itself. So maybe we can get into that a little bit. Um, I'm also a journalist, so I write for a bunch of titles, um, not least Dazeen, uh, exploring some of these themes and looking at the role that craft and design can play in bringing us towards a circular economy. I've got a podcast, which is called Circular with Katie Trigidden, uh, and uh, kind of regretting that name because I keep having to talk about myself in the third person, which never gets less weird, but there you are, that's what it's called. Uh, the first series was all about waste, so exploring some of the similar themes from the book um, but with a lot more freedom. So kind of taking waste as a, as a theme and then 
interviewing people from all sorts of different angles, which has been really interesting. And I'm currently recording series two, which is all about repair, mending, fixing, hacking, those sorts of things. Um, and I also do events like this, so public speaking in this sense, but also uh, deliver keynote speeches. So most recently I delivered the closing keynote for the 10th annual Vancouver Zero Waste Conference and had a lot of fun creating an Eames Power of Ten style video, which sort of dramatised the introduction to my book and talked about how there are a series of boundaries that things cross um, and become waste in the crossing of those boundaries from the our skin so our bodily fluids going from being perfectly happy inside our bodies to waste as soon as they come outside to the walls of our home the walls of the city the state walls uh, our coastlines the brunt line which is the line that divides the global north and the global south and then eventually our atmosphere so this idea that we're shooting waste out into space um marcus asked me to think a little bit about sort of where we are now in terms of sustainability in an industry and where we might be going and i think the sort of reuse, reduce, recycle sort of motto that we've all had drummed into us from a young age is, is kind of where we are now. Certainly, I think this is where consumers are um, thinking that, you know, by putting things in the recycling bin or using a reusable coffee cup instead of a single use one, they're sort of doing their bit. I'm not actually even sure the design industry to a large extent is, is this far. I think there's a lot of emphasis on new builds in architecture and kind of everything being new in an interior and again there are not that many people reusing waste in, in product design but where I would like to see us going is much more towards a circular economy so this is a, a framework that I've sort of put together very much based on the Ellen MacArthur Foundation definition of a circular economy but sort of rethought for the design industry um, which is about making design circular and the three pillars are uh, wasting less so you know we've got to design out waste and pollution that's kind of a very a very basic part of that and, and a big part of pollution is carbon um, so thinking very carefully about how to lower our carbon footprints um, and I think this is very much about collaboration it's about experimentation and it's about taking a materials-led approach and then uh, repair more and I think where the design industry has got a big role to play in this is is beginning with the end in mind so when we're creating things thinking about how they can be repaired down the line thinking about which pieces are going to go first and need replacing or how somebody might get into it to repair it and also the storytelling that's possible through repair I think there's some really interesting developments in in this area um, and also how things might be repurposed so the second tenet of the circular economy is to keep materials and objects in use so once we can't keep an object in use anymore, how might we keep its materials circulating? And then the bit that I think is most under kind of considered at the moment is this idea of think like nature. So this is the idea of growing things rather than making them. So one of my fellow judges on the panel is Sebastian Cox, and he's got an amazing project called Mycelium and Timber, which are these sort of lamps and stalls that are grown using the root structure of fungus. And also this is about regenerating natural systems. So I think at the moment, a lot of the focus in sustainability is on do less harm, but actually we need to be thinking about how to actively do good. So in the book, Cradle to Grave, which is somewhat of a seminal text for this way of thinking, they talk about the fact that actually at the moment, the planet would be better if we just removed the humans. And we kind of need to do better than that. As a species, we need to be contributing positively rather than just doing less harm. So I'm really excited to see what we get in terms of entries. And I shall be looking out particularly for projects that cover off some of these things. Although I'm kind of being careful what I say, because I, I had visions while Gary was talking of people who were thinking of entering going, right, delete the drone shots, remove the camera sliders. So I'm very conscious that people listening will be sort of paying close attention to what we're saying. Um, let me stop screen sharing. There we go. Yes, we need to leave people some space to be able to feel like they're doing right. something. And I, and I think with, with sustainability, I don't know if you agree with me, Katie, but we're not expecting people to have solved the world's problems with their chair or their aeroplane seats even. We just want to see some intent to take a step in the right direction, right? Yeah, so there's a, there's a fantastic podcast called How to Save a Planet um, by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. And she said something the other day on one of the episodes, which I thought was really lovely. She said, there's no silver bullet. You know, there is not gonna be one technological solution to the climate crisis. 
what will solve this is thousands and thousands of people trying and failing and trying again. And I think that's the spirit I want to see is a kind of genuine attempt towards something better. And, you know, I say the word genuine because we're not interested in greenwashing. You know, I, I don't want stuff that's been made to look more sustainable than it is. We've got a panel of expert judges. That stuff is not going to wash. But that's not to say, as you said, that everything needs to have been solved or resolved or, you know, we are very, very keen to see works in progress and ideas that are not fully resolved, but have made some progress towards becoming more sustainable. So very open to that sort of... Um, that sort of work in progress uh, concepts, I think. What's your view? I know you were talking before about, you know, repairing, fixing, mending and those kind of things, which, which sounds like a kind of uh, a small, small crafty approach to things. On the other end of the scale, you've got people talking about geoengineering and, you know, spraying crystals in the sky to reflect the sunlight. And, and um, you've got Bjarke Ingels company proposing like, re-engineering continents uh, what where does the solution lie is it in lots and lots of people doing lots of small things or is it are we looking for really big ideas and i'm not talking about particularly in disease awards entries but mm. to save to save the world yeah i mean i think the danger with those kind of big technological solutions is we've been looking for them since the 50s and there's been this idea that oh don't worry we don't have to do anything because somebody in the future is going to come up with some amazing big technological solution and we've really got five or 10 years left to kind of properly address climate change. And so I think we've run out of time for that kind of big magical silver bullet technological solution. I think now what we need is absolutely everybody working in the little ways that they can. And it's interesting that you described repair as crafty because there's a, there's a lot of kind of implications with those different words. So for example, when you say mending, you tend to think of textiles, you tend to think of women, and you tend to think of unpaid labor. When you say repair, you tend to think of men, you tend to think of wood or tech, and you tend to think of paid labor. And so there's an awful lot of kind of um, stereotypical kind of stuff bundled around some of these things. You know, repair can be something like the right to repair movement, which in America is kind of, ensuring that John Deere tractors are not locked down. So at the moment, they're saying that when you spend $80,000 on one of these tractors, you don't actually own it, and therefore you're not allowed to repair it, which means it has to go back to the people who built it. Whereas if other people could get in there and mend it, they'd sell fewer tractors, <laughs> but it would be much more sustainable. And that's a kind of big technological solution but it's based in repair and so I think you know the second tenet of the circular economy is to keep materials and objects in use and I think we've got to start thinking about ways that we can elongate the lifespan of products and that's got to be considered at design stage you know this idea that everything is completely locked down and you can't get the back off to get into the battery or whatever it is has got to be something we move away from we've got to be looking at ways that people or companies can extend the life of, of objects. You've also got to get people to want to do it as well, though, haven't you? Because, yeah. um, I mean, at least if you buy a 80,000, or you don't even buy a, a John Deere tractor, you, you lease it from John Deere. At least if it breaks, you can send it back and it will get fixed. But whereas if you buy a 30 pound toaster on the internet, as I've done several times, then after three months, it breaks. You are tempted to then go and buy another 30 pound toaster on the internet because you know that one will work and getting it the other one fixed is like just causes a headache that I have kind of no yeah. no no knowledge of where to turn to get this stupid thing yeah I mean yeah and there, there are repair cafes popping up all over the place that are trying to solve that exact problem um but I think it's why I'm interested in this idea of storytelling around repair because I think with the advent of the 20th century and mass production, we've got this sort of veneration of newness. So this idea that the moment something comes out of the box, it's perfect. And from that moment on, it starts deteriorating. Whereas actually I've got a lot of secondhand furniture and I actually prefer it a little bit beaten up because that tells the story. And I've, I've got this G-Plan coffee table, which I talk about all the time, but it's got coffee rings all the way around the edge. And I love it because I just think, you know, that's how many? So it was probably made in 1960. So that's what, 60 years of, you know, laughter and tears and arguments and conversations that have happened around that coffee table. And every one of those little coffee rings 
tells a story. And I think that's far more interesting. I recently bought some alcohol pebble tables, which apparently are the same age as me and they look brand new. And I was a little bit disappointed <laughs> because, you know, I could have just bought them brand new, whereas I wanted these lovely 40 year old, 42 year old uh, pieces of furniture. Um, and so I think if we can start to move away from this veneration of newness towards this kind of um, appreciation of the pattern of age, I think we can start to shift some of those things. Um, but you're up against then all the companies that produce new stuff that don't want you to go and buy. I mean, I feel sorry for Aircall actually, because I've just sold a whole load of Aircall stuff. It, it went for almost the same price as new stuff. <laughs> I've had it 15 years and someone else had it for 15 years before that, and it still retains its value. So like, it's, um, it's not a great business to be in if the old stuff is, is, is achieving similar prices to the, the new stuff. But I think it's interesting to see businesses starting to respond to that. So um, Skinflint are an amazing lighting company based down in Cornwall and they pull out, um, I think they pull out industrial lighting between 1920 and 1970 of kind of hospitals and, you know, big factories. And they've recently launched a take back scheme. So the idea is as long as you've owned a piece for longer than a year, you can give it back to them and they'll give you 50% off your next purchase. And I think it's really interesting, you know, there are jeans companies that offer repairs for life. And in some ways, that's counterintuitive. You know, why would you mend my jeans when I'm just going to buy a new pair? So well, to start with, I'm happy to pay more for those jeans because I know they're going to last me for the rest of my life. And I think jeans are interesting because nobody likes buying new jeans, right? Once you've worn in a pair of jeans and you've got them properly comfy, those, you know, if they can last forever, that's amazing. And so I think it's really interesting to see businesses starting to respond to these changes and come up with more interesting business models. And, you know, the rental market is another one. So half rent uh, furniture so you can have kind of furniture you would never normally be able to afford uh, in your home for as long as you want it and then you give it back and swap it out for something else and so I think there are different business models emerging but I mean definitely the kind of capitalist growth 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 model is a problem but also if people are buying things that last longer and can get repaired um, that's less work for designers and I've always sort of about this as the designer's paradox because designers as a community tend to care about the planet, tend to care about materials and pollution, but also their job is to make more stuff to put on that pile. And so they end up feeling really angsty about it. So how, how can you, how, how can designers find a way to resolve this paradox of that the world doesn't need more stuff, but that puts designers out of a job if no one wants more stuff. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I've always seen designers job as solving problems. And I think the problems are changing. So if you look back, kind of 20, 30 years, most designers wanted to design the next it chair. You know, they wanted to kind of design that iconic piece that was going to be on the front of magazines. I don't think that's what designers want to do anymore. I think most designers, as you say, are kind of concerned about this stuff. And there's some really interesting projects. So there's a piece, um, I'm going to double check the name of it. There's a piece called Coral Carbonate, which is a 3D printed structure that somebody has designed to be lowered into spaces where coral reefs have died to give kind of things for those creatures to, to climb onto and start restoring coral reefs. And the designers come up with that, you know, so I think, I think we've got to constantly move away from this idea that design is all about stuff and move towards an idea that design is about solving problems. And it's about working out what, what the right problems are to put effort into solving, I think. And um, finally, before we, we put you and Gary together in a, in a head to head, what is, what is your view about this kind of emerging digital world of design where people are creating products that, that don't exist, which in, in one way means there's not extra stuff in the world, but as we've already discussed, that creates another problem because it does consume a different type of resource in the form of electricity. Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's this idea that sort of digital stuff is free when it comes to, to carbon. But, you know, as you discovered recently with your website, it's not. Um, and it's it's a difficult one. I, I did a, a training course recently called Carbon Literacy. And one of the questions was, which has got less carbon, a paperback book or a Kindle? And it was sort of about thinking about the embodied carbon. So how much carbon has been used to make that Kindle and how much uses to, you know, every time you turn it on versus a book. But I was like, surely it depends how many books there are on my Kindle, right? Because you don't buy a Kindle in place of one paperback. My when I've got a mini iPad, but it's got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of books on it. So at some point, there's a tipping point where your Kindle is better than buying books. But equally, I don't think 
you know, there are books I've bought and downloaded onto my iPad that I've never read and I've forgotten I owned because they don't have that same tangible presence. Whereas, as you can see, I'm surrounded by real books in here that I sort of, so I, I, it, it's about how we interact with those um, products as well and what value they have to us when they're tangible or intangible. So as with so many of these questions, I think it's phenomenally complicated. And I think there are different different solutions perhaps for different situations. And it will be interesting to see as we hopefully emerge from lockdown and perhaps start traveling more, how these things change, you know, because I think there's been a, a big upsurge in digital products during lockdown, but equally I don't have to worry about how many books I'm carrying when I go on a train because I'm not going on a train anymore. So. Yeah, I think it's complicated. And, and I think as with all these things, we need lots more education and communication around the, the carbon footprint of different options. Right at the beginning of your talk, you talked about storytelling, um, which brings you and Gary and me actually together. And we, we do the same thing, don't we? We look for narratives, we look for stories. That's how, that's our creativity is to, to place a narrative on it, on something, hopefully one that people can understand and respond to. So I, I, I set you the challenge before of asking questions for each other. Do you have a question for Gary or just a, a message of, of, um, of some, some sort for him? I, mean, I think I'm interested in, we've sort of talked a little bit about the, the negatives of media from a carbon and a climate point of view, you know, things like all the servers that are sitting there, which need air conditioning, which is all taking up carbon or using up carbon but one of the things I'm quite interested in actually is the positive role of media and and very much as as you said Marcus about storytelling um what do you think the opportunity is for filmmakers and photographers like yourself to help to perhaps bring people on board and, and change people's minds in terms of this whole sort of sustainability piece yeah, um, my AirPods died. Am I? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, I, I, I think it's, um, I think it's interesting because y yeah, like like uh, documentary and 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 film and and other media can, um, you know, t I think I think enlighten people or or change their minds. I, I, I never set out to make films to change people's minds about anything um and, and I, I really hate it when uh you know films are so uh one-sided about an issue that they don't really you know they're, they're telling you how to think instead of giving you all the information and letting you make up your own mind but um but yeah i mean it's an incredibly powerful tool for for change as, as we've seen um you know so many documentaries over the years have have had an impact on sustainability or prison reform or you know so so many other social issues um and it, it, there is a there is that balance because 99.9% .9 of the media that's out there is is not doing this stuff and it's just kind of you know again kind of a uh, uh, just just piling up in some digital uh, scrap heap. Um, I, I was trying to think of when while well, you were talking about this idea of like circular digital media, like like like, is there some sort of way of like how do we recycle all this digital media that's being put out? <laughs> is there a way to kind of put an expiration date on um, on digital media? Um, we have these platforms that are actively encouraging us to to produce as much as many digital photographs and videos as possible every day um, and you know make money from the from our, our data so uh, I, should there be a tax on um, on on digital media is it is it just too easy to do this now um, I mean everybody you know obviously wants to communicate and we, we use photographs and video now as this way to express our, our identity on this global scale but is that uh, should should we should we allow that or, or should there be some sort of limits on it and Katie you, you talked about you know changing the the narrative or setting the agenda I mean we watched um, Sea Spiracy over the weekend now there's an example of a of a a media product that absolutely has changed millions of people's minds or at least opened people's minds to problems that they had kind of pushed to the back of their minds before if there was a design version of seaspiracy what would it what would its message be do you think i think 
and it's interesting you mentioned sea spiracy because I watched that this weekend as well and I think to your point Gary I mean it decided what it wanted you to think before it started right and then it, it hammered that message home very effectively um, and I sort of also then went and read all the criticism and the kind of people who distanced themselves from it and the facts they'd got wrong and ultimately agreed with them you know agreed with the film I've given up fish since Saturday but I kind of wish they'd done it in the way that Gary makes films, which is, you know, here are both sides. And I always remember specifically in Helvetica, and I don't remember the names of the designers, but you interviewed one designer who blamed Helvetica for the Iraq war and another designer who begrudgingly admitted that there might be other typefaces available. And it was just so lovely to see these kind of completely disparate opinions. Now that's difficult to do in climate change and, and within sustainability. And I think for so long, the idea of balance has been to have a climate change denier on the panel, which is not helpful, right? But I think we need to find space for the nuance and for the gray areas and for the complexities. You know, so often the debate is you need to go vegan or, you know, you need to give up buying new clothes or whatever. It's not that simple. It's phenomenally complicated. And actually there's not a huge amount that individuals can do. These changes have to come from big business and from government. And I think one of the opportunities that media and particularly long form media has is to hold space for some of this complexity and gray and nuance. And I would love to see more of that happening kind of in the design industry, you know, within more long form content. It's very, very difficult on Twitter and on Instagram to, to kind of hold these complexities. But I think, you know, long form journalism, like your opinion, Colin Marcus, or, you know, films or, documentary films there, there are spaces for these more complicated conversations to be had and I think they need to be had. And Gary do you have a question for Katie? Um, yeah I mean again I, I agree with everything she's 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 every point she's made so far <laughs> about um, you know the challenges but also about the opportunities too because I, I always think of, of sustainability as um, as creating these incredible opportunities. It's always looked upon as some sort of a, um, a limitation or a, um, you know, a, 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 a tax or a negative thing or, or, or you know, so, uh, you know uh, where there's a need for regulation. Um, but, you know, I, I see so many of these things as really like <clears throat> just common sense, profit driven um, decisions that can be made. It, it just, it requires thinking. It requires like design thinking. It requires like energy to, to kind of look at a situation and decide whether to shave a, you know, a tiny bit, a millimeter of plastic off the top of a, you know, a, a water bottle lid or whatever, and saves, actually saves money and saves resources. So I, I think that, that, when you um, reframe sustainability as this incredible opportunity for businesses to be more profitable or be more efficient or gain more market share, um, I think it kind of flips the the the, the script on that. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I I would love documentary to to continue to do that. I've for for you know for 15 years I've been saying that there aren't enough documentaries about about design being made, and there are so many subjects that uh, I think are, uh, you know, um, deserving of a, of a design documentary. And so I've been like trying to do everything I can to like encourage more young filmmakers to kind of get involved because I think there's so many subjects, you know, both present and historical um, that, that, uh, that can be explored and, and um, you know, enlightened and, and, you know, bring more people kind of, uh, you know, into this way of thinking. Well, for the, the architecture video category, we have got a, a, a time limit. I think it's seven minutes or something like that. So we're, we're not going to get a, uh, unfortunately, we're not going to get a seaspiracy, but maybe we'll get a little short movie that, that opens people's minds and, um, and maybe it impacts some kind of change. And it's early days. It's the first, day we, first year we've done both of these categories. So hopefully we can help the media make change on behalf of design. Katie and Gary, thank you so much for, for joining us. And I'm really looking forward to working with you to judge these categories. And meanwhile, if you're watching this, everybody, please enter. So we've got some good material to, to go through and some good discussions to have. Great. Thank you both very, very much.